There is no one in this room who can stand against me. Your mother's warned you about my coming. Fear the moment. But you think you could have a chance. But you are afraid. What if I could be the one? This could be the moment you've been praying for all your life. Welcome, everybody. Oh my gosh. I texted Jess the second after I got out of this movie. Is that right? Is that right? Literally, I was wow. walking down the steps of the Burbank AMC, and I was like, we got to talk about this. And it's not just that, like, one, I just love talking about movies with friends and just in general, but also, like, we've made a lot of comparisons to Dune on this podcast with world building, with how Peter Jackson's done it, with the world that Frank Herbert has built. And so I was like, you know what? Let's talk about this, because I know du Jess is a big Dune head, Um I have the popcorn bucket, so I've no. <laughs> I so gonna, you're so no, we're not getting that. I've, I've gotten Dune Head. <laughs> we are also, changing this show drastically. I realize I we should probably just change the show in total to be I'm podcast. Okay with, hold on, yeah. podcast of the things. Oh, okay. I mean, I do love like being like Middle Earth oriented. Yes, but, like, I agree. I, like little, but I mean, J.R. Tolkien has influenced so many other things. So like we could talk about Wheel of Time. We could talk about Dungeons and Dragons. We could, you know, if you ever watch Game of Thrones, we could talk like we don't have to do an episode by episode because that's just that's just too much. Sure. Um, but I think but, it gives us longevity to like be. Yeah. Podcast of the Rings colon podcast of the things I, yeah. I had that as i was going to sleep last night i was like how do we keep doing this <laughs> and right. that's what came to me no it, it, it is because like we're not huge book nerds you know we're not going to cover the appendices or the silmarillion and stuff like that which stories and that's not that what I people love. are coming to us for yeah. either um, exactly well i i so you're totally right that um I also thought why this was going to be good for us to cover, too, is often we talk about what it would be like to have not read the Lord of the Rings books before going into the movies. And you have the luxury of not having read the books and just which kind of blows my mind, actually. Like, so I get to kind of get to experience it from your perspective it, of and like how well did this bring you into the world? Yeah. And it's so crazy that like Dune was not a part of my life like at all. Sure. Until I saw, like, the poster for the David Lynch movie, or maybe it was, like, it was probably a like blockbuster, where I just, like, saw the cover, and I was like, oh, what's that? And then I sure. remember maybe seeing on TNT with, like, the big worms, I was like, what? Is you totally it, like, see it was the images so, as you grow yeah, up. Yeah, and it was sure. so weird and ethereal, and I was like, I can't, like, you can't, it's not a movie that you can stumble upon TNT and just like, oh, yeah, let me just watch 30 minutes of David Lynch's Dune. Like, you can't no. do that, honestly. Totally, You totally. can do it with the Neville News Dune, because it's I don't good. know if you can, actually, but. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it was so strange with, you know, loving Star Wars, you know, Matrix and Aliens and, like, all the sci-fi that I, you know, Starship Troopers. I've been playing a lot of Hell Divers too, so Starship Troopers has been, like, oh, fun. forefront of my mind. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it was so strange that, like, the book Dune never crossed my path. Nothing. Like, I've got it now, and I think I'm going to read it now. I would. Uh, I would. Be, because I was, that's why I was, like, saving this question for you is, like, does this come like this movie and we're going to get into full spoilers. We'll try and go like plot wise of like how, you know, I've got the full plot synopsis here on IMDb that it that will follow along. But does this movie complete the first book? So uh, what, what I wanted to ask you at the top with 100 percent in line with that question that you have, how much do you want to know how, whether it differs from the book or not? It's so tough because I thought like I'm down for more. I'm so down for more Denis Villeneuve Dune. It seems like he really loves this world. As much as I don't know about it, it seems like he's really, like, when I saw uh, on um, Getty Prime and, like, the little pit wranglers with, like, the, I was like, they didn't need to do that. No, They could have totally. been just more bald white dudes, but they made these, like, crazy Jester, hook costumes. Weird things. Yeah. It was wild. I was like, oh, they look like hooks, and then they hooked. The yeah. Yeah. I was just like, that's such detail that they didn't need to do at all and so i can tell that he loves this world as much as that i know that he's changed from the book from what i've read sure um so it's like i do i'm okay with knowing but like i don't want to know too much but i know so that he, it gets like insane way. let me put it this way 
when I first watched Pride and Prejudice with Kira Knightley and Matthew McFadden, I was in. I knew the whole mm-hmm. story, but I was ready to read it because yeah. I knew it. And so I think no matter what I tell you and what I, you know, what you learn is different, you're still going to have a unique experience reading it because I won't even be able to a properly remember everything that happens yeah. and b re- like tell you absolute. It's one of the most multi layered, almost to exhaustion lore ridden books there are he's he's dead it's dense but still well written so you're you i would be curious just from a reading standpoint how you'll experience it but because you're in you'll love it yeah like i thought about getting the audiobook because i've been you know don't, driving a lot don't, lately don't, no no read it I, read now, it okay read it and then listen to the audiobook because it is that dense but the reading experience is so much better because you will not be able to you want to read the the names and you want to understand how frank herbert's describing arrakis and describing the harkonnens or what are suspenser lights and all these things so the reading experience i find when i listen to an audiobook which i'm not dinging an audiobook whatsoever that's yeah. how i i imbibe that way sometimes you will lose the the richness of the world and it will go by too quickly rather than go holy crap let me read this again what was that you know what i mean so do read it is my strong now, piece of advice now you texted me that you are ready to be <sighs> underwhelmed can okay. i get before we dive in <laughs> yeah 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 um what were your first thoughts about the movie well let me just preface this too i don't know why but i just didn't care that that's this movie so was crazy coming to out. me like even just like even as know. a huge dune freak as you a think huge I'd dune like freak it, and just to... as like a movie event like this feels it, like i don't think we'll ever get another barbenheimer again like well, we might those... but it'll be something else it'll you be know? something else but just like how like you know the amc burbank like shut down like mm-hmm. you could like people were ebaying imax tickets to oppenheimer like Jeez. it was insane Jeez. so like i don't know if we'll ever get that again but you even texted me like oh the regular showings are kind of empty and i was like yeah i think it is like a you know even our, my friend dan merle does box office reports every week on his youtube channel and was like yeah oppenheimer didn't have as big of an opening because people are waiting to see it in imax you mean and same with oh yeah no 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 oppenheimer like oh. people like it had a good box oh. office opening but like same with Avatar, people were waiting to see it in the right format. And I think that's what's going to happen here. Is that I don't know what the next big blockbuster is coming out. But I think Dune's got the IMAX and Dolby theaters locked down for a little bit. And so it's for the next month, I think every weekend is going to be solid. Nothing. There's no, you know, billion dollar weekend coming. But I think every weekend is going to be good, good, good. I think people went out of their way to go see this movie for sure. But if you're going to spend the money nowadays on a theater experience you're gonna go see it in the right theater experience setting yeah and there is a difference like i'm no like people see it like the 70 millimeter imax i really can't tell the difference i'm sorry to say like i remember going to arc light and seeing um uh hateful eight on 70 millimeter okay sure and i was like oh i really enjoyed the movie but like if i'd seen it you know anywhere i would have enjoyed the movie the same but I saw the first screening. I didn't get an IMAX ticket. I got a Dolby ticket. And I was like, this is still great. Like when that like, you know, the the chant of like spice, power over spice is power over life. I was like, oh, let's go. Like, you know, it was so jarring when they when they did that. And then they still had the WB. Right. Uh, It was so upsetting. I was like, are you saying WB controls the spice? It was spice over power in Burbank. (laughs) Wacko, yakko and dot, everybody. (laughs) So go to the Glendale Galleria after this. Um, but then I remember I got off work early and I was like, oh, let me check some times. Cause like, I know I wanted to see it and I had a 10 AM showing on Sunday, but I was like, you know what? I- I'm already out. Let's go see this. And I saw it like at a regular screening. Cause all the IMAX and W were, oh, times were matching see. up or it was, you know, it was a Saturday night. So it's going to be busier. And I remember like I walked into the regular screen and I was ready for it. And just like that power of spice, like doesn't hit. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's so much quieter. Like, just at a noise level alone, go see Dolby or IMAX. I can't recommend it enough. Interesting. Okay, I may, I may, I may just do that. We saw a regular um, screening 
with wonderful sound. The sound was absolutely mm-hmm. immersive, but at a normal screen. Yeah. Um. So here's what I, the preface I was going to say is: for some reason, the 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 you know what it is? I think the difference and the amount of time in between the first movie and the second movie movie, I couldn't maintain that level of anticipation for years until this movie it's came tough. out. So. I kind of put those things on the back. I, this is how I deal with FOMO. It's like, well, might as well not even be happening. So when I get to it, I'll get to it. You said we're wanted, you want to do another podcast? Great. I'll go out of my way to see it now. I knew I was going to see it eventually. Let's just yeah. put it that way. And then when I was thinking about it, I was like, God, I have, I can't imagine he'll accomplish anywhere near what the book demands of it. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that. So I also was half joking when I said I'm prepared to be underwhelmed. I just kind of wanted to see your reaction. I'm going to say this. I overall liked it. And Ooh, I know hey. there, there are huge digressions, kind of interesting choices. Um, I'm just going to come out and say it now. I'm not a fan of Anya Taylor-Joy, and I don't like... She's perfect casting, but I'm pissed. (laughs) Did you know she was in the movie? No, I did not. Okay, so what was that reveal like? Because I saw, you know, I'm... It pulled me out of it. It Really? Just like Christopher Walken pulled me out of it, too. I'm like... I understand that because, like... I remember I was listening to a podcast about this, and it's like, no, I do like that no one put on, like, an affectation. Like, no one did a uh, Carrie Fisher in the first Star Wars, where she's kind of British, and then she just drops it for the rest of the movie. Like, Thank God. Like, Pugh is as American as they come, you know, a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Figures. But, uh, the I, only thing she says is figures, and that's weird. <laughs> well, no, Florence Pugh is British, I think. I know, but she does yeah. an American accent. Yeah. And, and she so, says figures. Figures. Uh, I did, that did uh, stick out to me both times, like, Figures. Okay. Figure. Got figures. Figure. <laughs> yeah, I say figures, but it's yeah. just like figures. I was like, figures. okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, just like I I was that was the not Annie Taylor jokes. I'm like, she looks like a ethereal spice princess, honestly, like just in real life. But Christopher it Walken, is good I was casting. Like, it is good casting, but at Christopher Walken, I was like, whoa. Paul yeah. Atreides. <laughs> you're, you're doing it all wrong. And there's the BMW commercial or Audi commercial with Christopher Walken right now, and everyone's doing the Walken to him. So it's 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 what did what did you want, Denis? What yeah. what was the experience? Now, I kind of like the idea of just this Hollywood royalty being the emperor. It's kind of I can kind of see the thought process they're going for, he's going for there. You know, and it's interesting too. The other thing I was really not looking forward to, mm. genuinely, was Austin Butler. I did I couldn't imagine him. I just I felt like he was hot because of the Elvis movie, and then they cast him. And I and everything I was seeing, I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know. And they did a good job with him. There's some he's big good. He's, he's very really good. good. Scott Rubin called it a Stellan Skarsgård uh, impression, which it totally is. is. Like I that would like might to... be his thing now. Like he did the Elvis voice and couldn't lose it, and now like he d- was literally doing a Stellan Skarsgård impression the whole movie. Which I don't know why. Like I would rather him have put his own spin on it. That also like was like I couldn't actually tell if it was Baron Harkonnen or Fade talking, and that was not great. You mm. know what I mean? I would have had him be a little bit more distinguishable. Um, and there's also some big differences which we'll get into. With how fade and the th- and things with fade go down, but but overall, I think it was very well done. I thought he was very good. I was I I wasn't disappointed. So a couple things I went into it um, not looking forward to. I that was oh the other thing too, they handled the worm amazingly. I I, was, I literally thought about you. When that happened, I was like, okay, this looks so much better than the first one. Like, uh, as, as someone who liked the worm design in the first movie, like, I was like, oh, it's got the mouth, this movie. Like, when they when it eats all the Harkonnen at the beginning, I was like, yes. oh, he's, like, eating them. It's not just, like, wide open. Which I could then believe that we're just seeing the mouth all the way open and not having closed. You know what yeah. I mean? And then they do an interesting thing when they're actually riding the worm – the idea, I'm sure you get this, right? That they lift a lip of the worm up, and the reason the worm stays up is because it hurts the worm, basically. So it's, yeah, 
it keeps it up above the surface because the worm doesn't want the sand to get in its, in its nostrils. Yeah, co- correct. So um, what's interesting is that they didn't keep the mouth up; they just kept the like the back of it up. And like I its just thought gills it was up. Yeah. So we let's go blow by blow. But the uh, the, the the thing I will say is, um, I was riveted when. He when he when Paul goes to ride the worm, it, was it is there's literally riveting. one of the best sequences like in the last thirty years of movies. It yeah, is. I don't know how hyperbolic I could be about that. Although I I I, I I'm sure you do believe that. I, I let's put it this way: I found myself sucked in more often than not, and more than I thought I was going to be. And that was like one sequence where I was like, totally nailed it. This yeah. is wonderful. And you know what they also did really well, which is why I like that it's a three-hour movie because you can accomplish this. You really see the rigors of of sand riding. You know what yeah. I mean? Like the, the whipping and the sand and then moving. So it was just to a T really, 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 really good. I loved it. Yeah, I like how the desert never became friendly. Like it's yeah, still yeah. – the, the Fremen – we're always talking like how hard it is to live there. And it is like, you know, even when uh, Gurney comes back, she's like, that's a whole lot of water standing right there. It's like, yeah, like that's how they think. Cause yeah. everything is so dire in this world that like is unforgiving. And it never, you know, becomes, you know, it never becomes Pandora. Like I, as much as I enjoyed the last avatar movie um, in the first one, they're like, everything will kill you here. And I know I realize that's like the point of it is like you're one with nature, so it's easier. But like it really fades into the background of how dangerous the world is, and it just becomes kind of like you know, a beach resort. I'm like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but like it can still be a dangerous place. Like people that are one with nature, like, a, like still respect it. Like, yeah, I I think that it, I I need to rewatch the first one. It's been I haven't watched it since I watched it the first time. Did. They did you really get a sense of how important water was in the first movie? I think so. Like especially yeah, when the guys like, like watering the well. palm, uh, when the guys like watering the palm trees, and he's like, the, "These palm trees drink water for like 120 men." That's or something right. Like that. I just need like, to rewatch it because I'm I'm forgetting. You know, my book knowledge ends up like fading into. The movie, and so I don't remember what they covered and what they didn't cover. Yeah. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the differences, and I want to know why and how this movie sucks you in to the point where, like, you're just full on Dune now. I'm I'm Dune pilled, as they say. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I what am. What is it? Wor- what is it about this movie that works for you? Like, it is the world building. As much as like you know, we always talk about like how people got sucked into Middle Earth that had never heard of it or read it before. Like it did. Like that first movie, explain the explain. You know, like we talk about David Lynch's Dune. You don't have the actress coming on screen and be like, "Hi." Welcome to Dune. This right, is right, this, right. this family and this is this family. You have one small thing that's like, hey, and then you just go. And right. it allows you to keep up, but it is dense. And is this movie so a little bit more so with like all of Paul's names, the great houses, the Emperor, I actually like couldn't he, believe they gave him every name. I was like, every name. They, it, it almost I couldn't imagine someone like yourself keeping up, truly. They really I, didn't like, stop. It's it's easier for me because I am into you know fantasy and sci-fi and stuff sure. like that, so it's easier. But like even <laughs> like uh, someone, there's a guy who works for uh, Giant Bomb, which is like a gaming company, and his name is Tamor Hussein, and he's like, uh, MFers are. <laughs> Uh, get confused by my name, but are called Shai Halud <laughs> like they went to high school with him. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> I was like, that's that is fantastic. a really good point. Like, it's like names aren't that difficult if like you just show interest in them and like like a desire to learn them. That's exactly right. It also reminds me of like you know how you have a cat that is named one thing, but then you have like twelve names for exactly. that cat too. Yeah. You have Paul Usul Muadib Lisana Gaib. You know, you got you got all these things because what is crazy is in that one scene they're like, well, you need this name, and then you need another name. It's yeah, it's insane. Like he needs a name. Oh, that's good, but you need a warning. Like, what? <laughs> it was too much, but it was great, but it was yeah. too much. Like, it's so, so, you know, I turned to Alex midway through the movie and I was like, they really made Stilgar 
the comic relief. He and and Alex called it the Gimli effect. This they is re- what, but this is why you hire Javier Bardem. That's right. Because uh, he towed you, that line perfectly. He towed that line perfectly, and that's what a trained Oscar-winning actor, like someone who plays Anton Sugar, the most ruthless one, like not one note, but like psychotic, no emotion killer can give you like the oh don't go into the the desert the spirits will kill you uh, but seriously <laughs> yes <laughs> nailing it nailing it yeah. um so i thought at first i was like oh no come on he's but if you're in the desert and it is such a hard place it's understandable that you find ways to joke around do you yeah. know what i mean it totally works so the what they did well, but that I also found challenging was creating the fact that there were fanatical Fremen and then there were not fanatical Fremen. Someone, my coworker said that too, and I kind of liked it in a way that in science fiction, in a, like especially Star Wars, there is one people on an entire planet and they're all together. Like, mm-hmm. I like find the, that challenging too. Totally. And it's like, and you know, and I always joke about, you know, Star Wars, like whenever during the Clone Wars, like, oh, we took the capital city. So we took over the planet. That's not how planets work. If someone takes over Los Angeles, they don't run the earth now or, you know, Washington, D.C., whatever capital you want to use. But I like that there's at least two different tribes of Fremen because it's a giant desert planet and there's millions of people. Of course, there's going to be fat, like, <gasps> Factions. So there are different types of Fremen. There are like, you know, deep in the desert. There's There certainly are um, more present Fremen in the world of Arakeen and all that. And then deep south. So that's yeah. real. Um, or at least referred to in the book. This is what I, uh, this is what I wanted to say and I forgot to say it at the top too. Um, very clearly, Denis loves this work and and treated it with love. Like, mm-hmm. he did not try to change this drastically so that he could make it his own thing. He really tried to dedicate him. I, at least this is my impression. He dedicated himself to making a movie that did this justice. And you're going to have to make some changes, especially for the modern world. Um, the Fremen, there are, like, definitely more ritualistic Fremen and people who believe a certain thing. Um, Stilgar and Chani, I don't know how come they would be in be together if he was a southern faction and she was... Yeah. You know, I don't know why that would have happened. So it was really interesting. And also, Stilgar's not this fanatical in the book. He, but he kind of is like, oh, that's interesting. He could be the guy. You know, he's, he's a little bit um, not skeptical, but like he's not bought in. No one's like fully bought in until Muad'Dib starts doing things. Um, I... I didn't at first quite understand why this choice was made, but on one hand, it does a really good job to show what otherwise would have been very hard to show that the Bene Gesserit plans planted these seeds of the prophecy. It the Bene like how different you view Lady Jessica in this movie is probably the best thing about it, and just like this is why you give this kind of source material to a guy like Denis Villeneuve because you are a Lady Jessica stan in the first movie. She's badass. She does the voice. She's training her son. She seems to love Duke Leto. Everything about it is great. And then this movie just like, whoop, just like turns it on But I don't know why they did that. I I actually don't know why she became the villain. I I don't, I don't like it. I think it it was unnecessary. Um, But it, but at the same time, she, I would have sooner seen, I would have rather see her want revenge for Leto. But what they did was ramp up the part of Jessica that's present in the books, who believes she's going to be the mother of the Weisach Heterach. She, so reminder, she's not supposed to have a male. Yeah. She's supposed to have a female. She's supposed to have a female with Duke Leto that would then mate with Fade and Fade and Leto's daughter would then have the Wisa Cataract. So that's why the mm. Bene Gesserit is pissed at Jessica. Yeah. Because she, she, did, she did it for two reasons. She did it w- for one reason because L- Leto wanted a son. And she loved him. Which they're not supposed to let love give, get in the way. And she had some hubris thinking, I think I can make the Wisa Cataract. 
So she diverted from, and she did in this, in essence, she did make the we saw Ketterer. Yeah. So good for her. So she's not, she is a little conniving. She's just built different. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca Ferguson kills it. When she oh my God. took like, oh. the water of life, it was intense and wonderful. It was, it was so it's... intense. And then like the way, like even from, and we're going to get into the plot. I promise guys, I promise we're going to get into the plot. Uh, there's just a lot to cover, but it's just like the way she goes in that first scene where she's still like, oh, like never turn your back to the open, all this stuff. And then immediately just like after the water of life is just like, oh, we need to start f- fanaticalizing everybody. Like, right. And it's like, oh, this is if you guys have not seen Dr. Sleep, go watch Dr. Sleep because she is terrifying in that movie. And it was very Rose the Hat of her. But OK, so let me ask you this, though. Why did she think? he needed to control the Fremen. Why did she need, what, what, what was her motivation? Uh, to become emperor. But why? I think, I mean, I don't know. We don't know all the machinations of her or the Bene Gesserit yet. Like, I think she does think that she created, um, what was the word again? The We Saw Ketterok. Yeah. I think she does think she, she created that. So that's why like fulfilling destiny Sure, I would have liked to see her do that to revenge Leto, and we didn't get that. I don't think you can have both characters wanting the same thing. Like, oh, pa- I can like she literally that. says that she's like, "Your father didn't believe in revenge," and, she, that's right. and he's like, "I do." Like, right? Yeah, that's fair. Um, that is fair. Okay, so do you want to go plot by plot, and then I can talk about the differences we, like, there's, there? There's... How, what's the best way to go about it? I think we can go like plot by plot. Like I've I've got it right here, and you know okay. we can talk about certain things, and there's certain things like we can you know coast over and just say like oh that was cool or you know I like this better. Or Perfect. Like so so yeah, I've kind of given a few details about some changes. I'll get into it more as if as we go beat yeah. by beat. Sounds good to me. And that's the thing. Like uh, for me with Lady Jessica, last point is that I feel like you know uh, Paul was going after the Baron. And mm-hmm. then she was going after the Reverend Mother, Charlotte Rampling. I can't think of, like, what her She's character amazing. is. She's so good. But, like, she obviously knew that this was her doing. Lady Jessica knew that that was I Reverend see. Mother's doing. And she's like, this is my adversary. I need to supplant her. Oh. While Paul was, like, trying to not supplant the Baron, but, like, going after the Harkonnen. So, like, I, I feel like the, like, it's, like film lingo like you need this adversary you need this adversary like you know uh uh gurney halleck was going after uh dave batista like that right. kind of thing right yeah. i understand that I, yeah. and i can get behind that um i just don't think she needed to be a full-blown vil- villain but i there is a reason why they did it and there's also a reason why um aside from exemplifying that the Bene Gesserit created this you know, prophecy, there's a reason why they created factions that were more fanatical with Fremen, and we'll get into that in a little bit, because there is a huge change that I've yet to talk about. Oh, I'm very excited. Yeah. All right, so we pick up right where we left off uh, after Paul uh, knife fights Jamis. Is it John Niss or John Miss? Uh, Jamis or Jamis. Okay. Yeah. After he fights Jamis. J-A-M-I-S. And I, I didn't realize that for the first, like, when I, you see the body, I didn't realize that was Jamis's, but I was like, oh, I wasn't up- sure, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure why they, like, left his body to be found, too, by the Harkonnens. I guess to distract? I, I guess so. Um, but we pick up right where we left off. The Harkonnen are tracking them. They get ambushed. And this is just real. I'll try not to gush too much, but just when they hear the thumper and they're like, oh, to higher ground, and they start running towards the rock, I'm like, how are they going to climb in that? And then they silently jetpack up. I was like, oh, we're in it now. It was so cool. The music kicks in. I was like, oh my god, this is the simplest thing, but it looks so good. It worked so well. It really did. Okay, do they ever explain where do the personal shields go in this movie? That was my one like kind of nitpick that no one has. I, I fret. Do the personal shields make worms go crazy because of the rhythm? Like, cause yeah, there's, they, there's a two, it's twofold. So, um, cause Alex had the same question when, you know, those uh, laser guns they were shooting. Yes. So those are called las guns or laws guns or whatever. And if that hits a shield, it creates an atomic response. Whoa, okay. So, yes to you can't have it in the desert because it attracts a worm. And 
B, <laughs> it it would create a huge reaction. In fact, I, I don't remember exactly where the atomic warheads come into play in the book, but I believe rather than shooting an atomic warhead at Eric Keen, they shoot um, a las gun at the shield wall that protects Eric Keen from the storms and then create an atomic reaction that way. Got it. At the, okay. Toward the end. So that's why the guy says no shields. It's a twofold reason because he knows they're being ambushed and they don't want to, he doesn't want to blow up his entire team because they won't call a worm up on that rock. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, it's, it's not well explained though. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever mentioned. Um, but uh, the Harkonnen or the, the Harkonnen gets slaughtered, and we see like them brutally, just like <sighs> ruthlessly <laughs> taking the water out of the all, all the dead, and not even dead, like semi dead. Like the guy's like, stop! She's like, that, that, put your hand down. You're done. I just, loved like, that. That's when you get Zendaya. To, she's at her best when she just. She's like, so good in this movie. Yeah, like, she is very good at this. Uh, so they make it to a, what is called the Siege, and obviously all the Fremen are like, Paul, Jessica, you're worthless, get out of here, we hate you, you killed Jamis, he was my boy. Um, and Stilgar basically says, like, okay, you can either become the Reverend Mother, or we're gonna return you to the well right here, which is this crazy huge, like, millions of decaliters of water, and it's just basically their giant graveyard. Uh, yeah. of like everybody that's died and that's so it shows you how faithful the fremen are that they have this entire body of water in this desolate wasteland and he even says like if all of us are dying of thirst we would just die before we drank this water right yeah and i love that it's beautiful it's beautiful they are water rich but it's all their water discipline. So interesting. I, I forgot uh, this until we were just talking about it right now. When he kills Jamis, he gets his water rings, which you see them lift the the rings up. That's basically the water he owns. That so and they oh, and they represent okay. it in rings. Um, in the book, Paul presents those rings to Chani to marry her. Essentially, I think, um, or at least she puts rings in her hair, and it's like she's his. But actually, also Paul inherited inherits Jamis's wife in this transaction because okay he won, so he he comes out with a wife right away <laughs> wow and like two kids basically so um early right away he becomes really in, in into the tribe um so yeah that's the cistern thing is beautiful um and 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 yeah that, that what what I, I don't know if you caught this and you probably did but there are thousands of these all across Iraq. Yes, he says we. He says that there it's are thousands fascinating. of these. Fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. and that kind of goes into like a, a nitpick I have later um, oh, that we'll okay. get into. Um, but oh, before I forgot, we open with Florence Pugh kind of giving us like a recap a little bit, sure, uh, of like what happened like overnight. Uh, the Harkonnen uh, destroyed House of Trades. Do we ever and, and hear her name? I don't think so. Which is weird, right? It is. Maybe Reverend Mother I don't think says you it. ever I don't hear think her name. So. I don't think so either. I think because I remember. Which is really strange. Yeah. It, Rulon, like, yeah. Because I remember hearing it on a podcast. Like, uh, she plays Prince of Rulon. I was like, oh, that's her name? Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess not. Alex said the same exact thing to me last night. He's like, who? I was like, Florence yeah. Pugh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's strange. I, I think, it is strange. And that's, that's star power right there is that you can, you're just like, oh, yeah, Florence Pugh. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah that's, that. all, that's all you need. Um. Uh, basically recapping the movie and like we kind of get introduced to like which I think is a good way to recap the movie Flor like diary is the perfect expositional tool and that's what she does in the books too okay got it that makes yeah, and I love the diary of like her just talking and it's like sketching yep, like yep and the metal that's that's why you got to read the books because the way he describes how things are taken down and and like they they unfold these films that are this big and they can yes. read giant like tomes of books it's fascinating so yes. yeah they they they're they're doing it they're they're nailing it love it so after that uh Lady Jessica is given the choice to become the Reverend Mother by taking the water of life which later we will find out what that is she does. She barely survives, and Paul says it's because, like, of her Benny Gesserit training to overcome poisons. And in that, she be uh, her the daughter in her becomes awakened, and they start communicating with each other. And basically, like, the daughter becomes sentient in her womb, which is 
crazy. <sighs> so it it's one of the most um, un- Alia is one of the most tragic characters of any story and multi-layered and the books go into things that happen to Alia that it is um insane so Alia becomes what's called pre-born in that moment mm-hmm. and then I believe she's birthed shortly after yeah, I was told that there's a three year time jump once that once Lady Jessica takes the water of life and then it goes like to Paul learning how to ride the worm and obviously Alia is born. And that's kind of like the someone mentioned that like the passage of time is kind of weird in this movie of like how long Lady Jessica is pregnant. And I realize I understand why she's not in this movie. The daughter isn't in this movie. Um, but like, you know, like, oh, only Fremen ride this like or is pregnancy still nine months in the dune world is it longer (laughs) i would imagine it's shorter honestly well well, it's just like how long is lady jessica pregnant because like she doesn't give birth in this movie and then paul like does every fremen ritual like in six months i don't know right right it it, alex all of a sudden was like wait it wasn't like two years i was like well she was pregnant for a long time then yeah so so it was a really weird digression. I just, I guess they did, they did, they must not have known how to like handle this little baby that's walking and talking without making it look like a joke. Exactly. Like uh, I watched the, the scene in the Lynch movie of the daughter talking to the emperor. I was like, okay, I'm very glad they didn't do this. It's, it's fantastic. Cause it's so it bad. It is so Here's insane. It is a cataract. Because yeah. like she still talks with us. It, so Alia comes out walking and talking basically. Yeah. And, and, Frank Herbert explains this. She still has a soft palate, so she can't f- formulate words. But she's like talking to to Paul's wife and saying, "You do this and get them coffee." It's, it's insane. It's crazy. Yeah, she's like using the voice and everything. It's like it's wild. But like poor baby, if you think about it, like just like suspend disbelief and agree that this is like this actually happened to a baby in the womb. That poor baby got shocked into consciousness and is frightened it is oh, for sure wild um wild. but i thought that they handled it well despite the difference um uh, yeah the fact that like the baby itself only says one line at the very end of the movie and it's just lady jessica like oh she's saying this she's saying this like i thought it was well done so did so did, that worked for you then? Like you kind of understood that the baby was awoken? Is that what you understood? I think it works because like... Because you didn't know this, right? Before no, the part. Yeah. I had no idea. I thought it worked perfectly because of Rebecca Ferguson. She sold sure, it. Sure, sure. Um, it does make the prophecy and whatever's happening in the Fremen world even that much more mystical. Yeah. Right? Like, and the thing is... Everyone was afraid of Alia. They understood. They didn't understand what was what she was. She so when the Reverend Mother at the end of the movie calls Paul an abomination, she's actually in the book talking about Alia. Alia is the Got abomination. It. Got it. Okay. Yeah, but in the book, even though it's like like how could how could Jessica have done this to the baby? She was going to be killed. You know, she knew she was pregnant. She had to do it. There really yeah. wasn't a choice. But that poor baby. Anyway, Alia is fascinating to me i'm very excited to read i'm very very excited to read. yeah there's there's book three is where it really kicks off man it really goes crazy excited but yeah. yeah so we we learn here that stilgar and the southern tribe are quote-unquote fanatical sure. and cannot wait for the lease on al Gaib and obviously think that it's paul and right. lady jessica surviving the water of life is another sign meanwhile right. chani and her friends are from the northern tribe and they're like no the Lisan is going to be Fremen. He's going to be our people. We don't need a savior. We don't need an outsider or a foreigner to help us. And I like this side of the story. I like I like the the contention there. And I like uh, Zendaya. She's just great. So because uh, at first I didn't quite understand why they made this huge digression. Huge digression. Johnny is on board from That's day one with Paul. But not like, yeah, take over. Yeah, be power hungry. She's not, it's not like that. Um, Paul is absolutely, lays bare his chest to Chani and they are as one. So it's not uncommon 
this is important to note for later. It's not uncommon for them to have multiple wives, right? He never oh, sleeps okay. with Jamas's wife, but like Chani understands that there's like you could have two because you yeah. won in this war or something. And interestingly enough, with the passage of time, which is about five years in the book, if I remember correctly, um, Jessica marries Stilgar. Oh, okay. Which totally works if you think I'm about okay it. I'm like, okay with it. Right. It's, I'm not against it either. I, you know, I can't help, in the first movie, I can't help but think that there's some big Oedipal things going on between Paul oh, and Jessica. It's pretty absolutely. insane. But my, my, it's important to remember this because I'll, I'll share a little bit more towards when we get to the end. But Chani understands everything Paul's going through because Paul is com- it's completely clear with her. Now, the other thing that's a digression is Paul, I think he talks about the golden path in the first book, but he never explicitly says what exactly he's afraid of because he's not quite sure. In the movie, he's afraid of the desolation that he's going to cause by yes, becoming... the billions uh, of deaths, yeah. So um, him taking over Arrakis is not what the actual golden path is. It's on the path to it. Oh, it's okay. part of it. Um, but, but, and, and so I can certainly see, like, e- even if we expand in future movies, the golden path, this is part of it. And so I can see him being afraid to rise to emperorship yeah. to bring up about this destiny, but it's not what the ultimate part of the destiny is that he's actually afraid of, which is interesting. So anyway, Chani is 100% on board. And and at first I didn't quite understand why they made this change. But then I, but then Alex and I talked through it. It is the best way to not make this a 100% white messiah story. Yes. And I think it was a, like, I don't. People are really like I, I I saw on TikTok. People are already making uh, Paul Atreides the next Patrick Bateman, the next Tyler Durden. Like people are missing the point of this movie horribly. Like they're already like making like Sigma edits of him and like oh my oh. god he stood on business. It's like he's the bad guy. Yeah, that yes. like that's the ho- look. Oh my god! Like <laughs> he chooses. <laughs> To become this thing and maybe like the water of life, you know, taints his mind, like whatever you want to say, but like something in him changes and he stops being the protagonist in the third act. And that's what people are really missing. And it's, it's like media literacy is just dead. It's just (laughs) dead. (laughs) And it's like really sad. And I don't like mean to sound condescending like that because people are just like blatantly misunderstanding this movie that couldn't couldn't be more clear about what it is saying the fact that this movie ends with chani leaving and i noticed that the second time after the, the emperor kisses the ring there's no hero shot of paul at all there's nothing there's no like sunset it it does it with lady jessica and that's when uh Ani, Ani taylor joy says oh what's happening he's like the holy war is starting then he goes to stilgar saying long live the fighters and then it goes to chani and she is the final shot right because right. she has become the protagonist, the protagonist of the story right and I, like, oh, so I what's interesting what's interesting is frank herbert toes the line perfectly of paul is the bad guy and paul knows it but paul's also doing the best he can with this lot he's been given he didn't ask to become the we saw Keterok. he was made to become that you know what i mean yeah there's there's greater things at play the Bene Gesserit, like really weaving this whole like really the force behind almost all of this it's fascinating yeah. um those same dude bros that are sigmaing him are the same guys who would say that frank herbert's original story isn't a white savior story and they're just categorically wrong yeah now, I don't think Frank Herbert is saying that's what they needed was this white guy or was this foreigner, but he's showing the politics and, and all the problems with that. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's unfortunate if you walk out going, there's still part of me watching it going, 
He's gonna be okay. He's gonna no, be No, you there. want... And that's the thing is that, like, spoilers for my favorite show of all time, Attack on Titan. Right, right, right. Um, my, like, where that show goes, uh, like, watching this, I'm like, oh my gosh, Isayama, the, the manga author, obviously pulled from Dune because oh, Aaron Yeager and Paul Atreides are, like, one in one almost with their tragic path. And even my mom, like I got my parents into Attack on Titan. One of my no crowning achievements. Way. Swear Stop. to God, they love it. So they cute. love it. Um, so cute. And my mom would just text me. She's like, oh my God, I feel like what Aaron has gone through. Like I know he's doing wrong right now. And that was the thing is that people, well, I don't want to talk full spoilers of Attack on Titan. That's a whole different podcast. Because I think you may have gotten me to want to watch it. So Definitely. I cannot. I'm telling you. Everybody listening to this podcast, give – I think the first season is still on Netflix. So, I mean, they're raising prices again. I don't know who has Netflix anymore. But <laughs> uh, the the first season, like how it hooks you, where it goes, it is so good. You come for humanity versus these man-eating titans and you'll stay for the rest of the craziness. And that's why I don't want to give away too many spoilers. But just the pain you see, like – and I get we're we're I'm trying to do plot wise, but there's just so much to talk about. When he says to Chani right before the knife fight, "I will I will love you for as long as I breathe," he means it. Oh yeah. He like he does love her, and he when he looks at her after he says, "I will take Florence Pugh as my wife," and you know become emperor, he knows what he's doing, mm-hmm. and he knows the path that he is choosing. Yep. But it's just, it's so heartbreaking to see. And like, God, Timothy Chalamet, like someone, <laughs> there's a, <sighs> there's a whole Shaq uh, thing where, you know, he's on TNT talking about basketball. And I think he was like trashing a player. And then they had like a triple double. He's like, oh, pardon me. I was not familiar with your game. And that's become a meme. And so <laughs> everyone was like, Timothy Chalamet, pardon me. I was not familiar with your game. Like, <laughs> and that's. I, I like Timothy Chalamet. I liked him in Lady Bird. Um, I liked him in, you know, uh, Call Me By Your Name. But, like, he was this little, like, twink boy. Like, oh, like, he's a little emo boy. He's, like, scrawny, but he's a really good actor. Beautiful totally. boy's great. He, when that speech that I started the podcast on, and he, like, you know, kind of gets down on one knee while he's telling, like, this, could it be you? Do you want to, like, I... Oh my God, I couldn't like that. And he's doing it in Fremen too, which sounds like he's a native speaker. It's it so sounds, good. That is so good. It sounds like Liv Tyler speaking Elvish. It goes there. <laughs> like, it's just that good. That scene, like, I almost forgive Dude Bros for making Sigma edits because that is a really. Sure. Sigma moment. I'm just like, sure. oh my god! He walks into, and the way they show the crowd of like the little spotlights in the cave where you they don't need to show everybody, but you see how big this arena is, right? Right. And he just captivates where he's like, why would I break my knife before a fight? When he's talking about Stilgar, I'm like, and Lady Jessica's like, slow down. He's like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna Vin Diesel this thing and hit the Nas <laughs> like. <laughs> He definitely did. I, listen, I'm going to be honest. I wanted a little more nuance from him, especially at the end. I wanted, he, he kind of goes from whisper to yell, and there's not a lot of in between. I wanted a little bit more, like, finesse. I think it's because you've had two hours and 15 minutes of whispering where he's been like, I'm not the, I'm not the Messiah. And, you know, you have Stilgar being like, see, he's saying he's not the Messiah. But do you Even need more him Messiah. to yell in order to prove that he's the Messiah? Not, Although that line mean, was so funny, though. He's yeah. more the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Stilgar, ultimate I was, hype man. Ultimate I was, like, hype man. so curious how they were going to believe in him still after saying that. And then immediately I was like, oh, that's it. That's how they, that's how they got it. And they did that scene so perfectly because you've seen that group of old men at every coffee shop you've ever been to just like old men being like, yeah, yeah. Like even if they're like, you know, (laughs) talking about soccer or whatever, they're just like, oh yeah, Messi is the goat. Yeah, he is. That's great. That's exactly Uh, right. But, uh, but no, I, one, I he needs to yell because he's speaking to millions of people. But when, like, I feel like he he rode that line perfectly for me, at least. Not at the end for me. He didn't write it perfectly for me at the end. I when he like, was 
when he's when talking, he was like, talking to Walken. Walken. Yeah, I think he did not need to yell there. I think I, I would have just liked to have seen. I wanted, and this is funny. Kyle MacLachlan does this pretty well. I wanted the mature Paul to go. No, I've totally got you. I don't need to yell if I got you. You know what I mean? He. I don't know. I disagree because like. He's not just talking to the emperor. He's talking to everybody in the room. And, like, I'm not saying he needs to yell, but just, like, when he... One, the emperor still doesn't know that, that that's Paul Atreides until he says it. I don't think he knows what Paul Atreides looks like. No, he, he does. He knows it's Paul. Because that's why he's there. Muad'Dib, Paul, sent him... He, he oh, that's knows. right. Yeah, he, he, knows he did the, the crest. You're right. You're right. My yeah. bad. Um, but... I don't know. I think just like he's like, I'm here for my father, Duke Leto Atreides, like Duke of Arrakis, like just listing off like this is like like Russell Crowe, Maximus Decimus Meridius, father to a a murdered wife, husband to a murdered like it's just he's just he's in the pocket right there for me. And I understand like um, who was it? Um, Did you did you ever see Guardians of the Galaxy 3? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. um, The. The villain, I can't think of the, the maker, the creator, whatever his, his name was. Oh, yes, yes. With the scratches See, for me, on his face. He, that was a good, very good performance. But at the end, it was very shouty for me. Yeah, Very, very that. shouty. Where, like, at a certain point, basically, like, when Rocket shows him, like, oh, the dampifiers are humidifying instead. And then he's like, how do you know that? Like, and after that, he's just constantly screaming. And I'm just like. Totally. Ah. It is – he's so terrifying. Uh, he's so good. But, like, for me, that was, like, a little too shouty. For This, for me, worked. It worked. I, so I guess what I'm saying is I wanted the in-between a little bit yeah. more. No, That's I get all. it. Yeah. Just a little bit. Um, yeah. It didn't not work. It there was t- But there was just, like, a little, couple moments where I would have liked him to be reined in just a little bit and show some of the mature Paul. Um and it was there, you know, when his hair is now all back because he uh, dipped oh, in the water. Oh, the hair change, the hair change. <laughs> like, I, you know, I've been seeing so many, uh, uh, like, kind of so bad questions on, like, the press junket for this. And sure. I'm just like, my number one question, Vic, Paul, I mean, Timothy, tell me about the hair. <laughs> like, you're, you got full emo bangs in the first act, and then you just go full slick back. Like, this feels... Like, he feels like he goes into David Lynch's Dune in the third act of this movie, and I love it. There's actually a lot more Lynch's Dune in this version, that I, and I'm surprised. And I'm, I'm actually, oh, for lack of a better condescending word, proud of Denis to not... I felt like he tried so hard to not be Lynch in the first movie, and this time he let the oranges show up. You know, mm. he wasn't afraid of that. He let some of the voiceover creep back in. You know what I mean? He let some of the oil into the room that was very prevalent with Baron Harkonnen in the movie. So, um, cause you can only digress from the source material so much. And yeah. that's what I think Lynch achieved to begin with was not making another star Wars. He very true. Very different his, from star Wars. He did his utmost to not replay the version of space. Everyone knew up to that point. And, and you could tell the studio trouble? really wanted it. The, yeah. the studio wanted star Wars. The, Oh, the studio, that's like, right. The studio thought they had Star Wars, and they're like, okay, we have this great director making this amazing sci-fi classic. We're going to have another Star Wars on our hands. What did they think was going to happen? Like you, But even in this movie, you can see a little bit of that where, um, like, the third act kind of goes like, okay, once, for me, my biggest complaint, and especially watching it a second time, is like, once he decides to go south, we hit the gas pedal on right, everything. Right. right. It's like he he veers off uh, on his worm and then he's like, oh, I'm going to take the the potion. Oh, I'm unconscious. Oh, Chani now has an ornithopter somehow and flies there and <laughs> sure. Lady, Jes- Lady Jessica's there and then and then he's Lisan Al-Gaib like mode and it's just like we're not looking back. And it's like I wanted, I, I love all of his internal struggle leading up to that. Like, all his conversations with Shani and like you can tell she loves him, but she's yeah. still like, I know it's there. 
I know what you're being asked to do. I know what you secretly kind of want to do. Right. Or like not want to, but like maybe being called to do by literally right. everybody. Like the minute Gurney Halleck shows up, he's like, hit the nukes, lead these people. They love you. What are you waiting for? Like, right. Right. And it's such a good performance by Josh. And it's such a good performance because I didn't know Gurney Halleck besides Patrick Stewart leading a pug into war. And so I didn't know if he sure. was like, because they hadn't, they kind of explained a little bit. Because like, isn't in the Lynch Dune, like, wasn't he like kind of borged out? Wasn't he like brainwashed or something? And they had to. No, no, I don't think so. Was he not? I don't think so. I could have sworn they were like, he was like fighting him. And then he's like Gurney and he kind of like wakes up from something. Maybe I'm wrong. I could be very wrong. Maybe I'm just confusing two Patrick Stewart things. Very possible. Yeah, I know. I don't remember that. But um, I think at first he doesn't know that it could. I think everyone thinks Paul's dead. So he yeah. might be fighting him and not realizing it's Paul. But I don't think he's borged out. He's just he's just with the, um, the with smugglers. What are, the smugglers. Yeah. Yeah, when I, I love, so. oh god, what an entrance! Like I knew it was coming because, like, I saw him walking on the sand. I was like, I can tell by your footsteps, it's you, old man. I knew that line was gonna cut, like, come back oh, into play. Really? Yeah, like just because I saw, like, Josh Brolin, what a presence! But like, I yeah. saw him walking. I was like, something about the footsteps is gonna like, because he's got you know the full helmet on. Like, you can't see that it's him. And then, like, the way he, like, just trips him and then just, like, he's like, I knew by your steps it was you, old man. I was like, we're so back, baby. We're so back. <laughs> so cute. That and then he's great. like, young young lord or young lad. Like, oh, my God, it's such a good. Young re- pup. Young pup. That's what it was. Even better. Young, yeah. Like, and that's because you have this lord, literally the lord of Atreides, being, like, just absolutely wrecking shop with the Fremen for months. And just becoming a leader, becoming a Fadaikin. And this is the one guy that can say young pup to him and him just being like, it's me. And just like not be offended, not being like, oh, the, the pup's gone. The, the big dog's here. Like some stupid line like that. But it's just like, oh, that's his father figure right there. It's the man who trained him since birth. It's so it's such a good moment. Yeah. And it's, it's just sweet. well, it's so well played. It is sweet. And the, he's family. And I love that. I love that Chani's like, well, if he's family, I'll help him build the tent. You oh, know, such, I love it's that. It's so good. Like where, yeah. like, she, like where she's like, that's a whole lot of water right there. And you're like, damn, Chani. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, then he's like, no, he's family. And then she's like, okay, I'll go help him set up his tent. Like, totally. Like, like I just got done training your noob ass out here. Now I got to go do it again. I love um, it. But I like we, you know, going through the plot a little bit, it's basically just like a a montage of them disrupting the spice. And like I say a montage, but really great action scenes and just like the realism of this world where like any, you know, you look at Star Wars. Yeah, the shields are up, but we can still shoot out. But the steel, but like, no, the shield has to come down for them to shoot. And it's just like that. Oh, that's so, that's that's so good. Yeah. And it's like that whole scene. And then like. Chani, and then she just like turns around, rockets, load, like doesn't even blink. So good. So And then good. just like the them repositioning as the leg is going up. And then I love it's like there's not a lot of cussing in this movie, but I love when like he's trying to distract and then like he sees the leg start to move, he's like, ah shit. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what you would say. Yeah. And then, and then I love, especially when he's about to ride the worm, and he's like, okay, okay, okay. I'm like, that's me. That's what I say before. I'm like, okay. Like he's talking to himself. Genuinely, then, I thought that was such a good touch. Was like such just a good touch. And then you see, because he's like, breathing heavily, and it's like, please stop. But breathing like, heavy, he would be. He would be, and then just like, and they're like, oh, call a big one, and then you see, and he's like, oh my god, not that big. And it's just like such good oh. visual language, and the whole worm taming sequence is so cool. It's like. They really Half, nailed it. Like the sound design of it slowly coming towards you. And it's so good. And then. I, and you know what's really great too? They, you see it cresting the hill and uh, Javier says, not that big. And then you, you, you see it's below and you don't see it making the sand spout anymore. And then it comes just to the left of where you think it was going to come out, which is even more unsettling because you right. can't control this thing. It's You wild. can't control this giant thing barreling down on you. And then when he, like, gets 
you know, sucked into the wake of the sand. It's very dangerous. And it was, it just really was well done, a riveting sequence. I was in already, you know, but it, but it really blew me away how they handled that. I thought that was really great. And with that, as Paul has be- officially become a Fremen in name, uh, he's Muad'Dib, he's the Desert Mouse, which, you know, Stilgar is still like, oh my God, what a perfect name. It makes its own water. Like <laughs> ultimate hype man Stilgar. We're going to take a quick break, guys, and be right back. Spice, 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 spice. All right, we're back talking about the Roman Empire and Timothy Chalamet being the rep for all. You know what? <laughs> Dune is my Roman Empire. I cannot <laughs> stop thinking about it. Do you know, um, I believe Frank Herbert said, and they do talk about this a little bit in the books, that the Atreides family can be drawn all the way toward like the Greek era. The, oh, like They're related okay. to the Atreides in Greek mythology. So I love that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So now we are headed to uh, Getty Prime, which Florence Pugh gives us some amazing exposition about Fade Rotha. And this mm-hmm. is how the, the such good like film speak, for lack of better words from this dumb gub. Um, uh, the Reverend Mother literally says, like, Paul was not our only option. We have other options out there. And you didn't know that. I didn't know that. No, you, you knew that. I didn't know that. And well, I was like... Because I didn't know how they were going to get, like, you know, like, Fade Rotha, I don't remember much of the Lynch movie, but I just remember him being like, oh, here's the lieutenant that, you know, Paul's going to have to show down with. It's very much more kind of conventional of, like, who Sting is in the in the Lynch movie, at least from what my recollection is. Did you see it? You have seen the Lynch movie? I have movie? seen it. Okay. So... This is what's interesting to me, and it's a little bit of a digression, but for movie speak, it works. Paul is not supposed to exist. Paul yes. does exist. So Fade would never have gotten the Gamjabar because Fade's not going to be the Wiesak Hedorak, and they wouldn't want him to be. What they might have done is mate Fade with Ireland and then had the Wiesak Hedorak after that so the the Bene Gesserit do want that and when they test Fade and uh Margot Fenring the Bene Gesserit seduces him it it doesn't actually make sense that they would do that because he's not we saw Cataract level and I probably he probably wouldn't survive the spice either but he might just in the same way that Paul does right yeah so it works it just is a weird it, what they're trying to say is that the Ben Gesserit has plans within plans. Margot Fenring says that when they're at the stadium brawl, plans within plans. There are. And that is like the through line through all seven Frank Herbert written books. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, I and, feel like I look like Lady Jessica with the light on my face like this. Oh, right now. very much so. I like it. Right. I like it. Uh, subscribe to Patreon to see this. <laughs> um, but uh, I do like this whole Getty Prime thing is so cool because when they're when he's sharpening the knives and, you know, getting body paint on, there's color. And then, you know, and like I love the line from uh, Florence Pugh. He's psychotic. It's yeah, like, yeah. Thank you. And just in case we weren't about to see him <laughs> stab two concubines for no reason. like Right, right. <laughs> correct. And just like, oh my gosh, the second one, like it's one thing to like, oh, throat slit. The second one where he just like stabs her like three times and she just like has to stand there and die. I'm like, ah, oh, God, that's so yeah. bad. It's um, bad. It's bad. But this also shows why. Because, like, you see, you know, you see Dave Batista, you see the Harkonnen. They're very intimidating. You know, they're skinheads. They're very scary looking. This is why the Harkonnen went and hired the Sardaukar was because House of Trades don't play. Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck got these boys whipped into shape. Uh, now, I recognize this guy. He, this is, I had to look him up. Oh, I'm this not is gonna, the guy that, that he's, This that is fights. the guy that isn't drug that fights right. him. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I know this actor's name, but his name is Roger Yuan. But I did recognize him because he's the bad guy from Shanghai Noon. He's the main oh, bad guy from Shanghai Noon. He fights great. Jackie Chan. 24 years ago, this man is looking good. He's in shape, and he is still fighting a 25-year-old Austin Butler and hanging. Like, that's how good Atreides is. Is that I don't want to say a random. He's a lieutenant. He's earned his stripes. But, like... He's not Gurney Halleck. He's not Duncan Idaho. Right. And he right. almost he 
he almost kills Austin Butler yep, twice. He does. Yep. After yep. after being starved and probably tortured and probably drugged other days, like and being you know having no sunlight exposure at all. all and if that if it wasn't for him? that person, yeah, with a hook in him, and you know almost gets him with the personal shield, but then you know Austin oh, Butler yeah. like Fade Ratha is like oh. You're not drugged. And he looks at his uncle and he's like, happy birthday. Show me who you are. And that's when you hear the uh, Leah Sadu, who, to be fair, voice or no voice, she could do, like, she would absolutely get her <laughs> way with Margo? me. Is that her name? Yeah, it's Margo, <laughs> Leah Sadu, who, what, a, what perfect casting to, like, oh, it be, totally a smart, works. be a smart Bene Gesserit and the exact person you would send to, you Seduce. know, tame an animal like, uh, like Fade Ratha. Um, and <laughs> just like, like, uh, like the, the fire, the, like the black fireworks on the, and the black sun is the so oily, cool. oily, and then oh, they have it white at night. It's so clever. It's so well done. Like, again, unnecessary. Like, maybe, you know, book people like you would have been like, oh, where's the black sun? Or, you know, something like that. No, but I don't no, even think I would have cared, you know? Exactly. No one would have cared. But it's just like this, we're establishing this world for this reason. So this is a big digression, big being a strong word here. Um, Fade is not honorable and poisons his knives. So all he would need is to get, yes, he would fight, you know, drugged up men in the arena, but all he would have to do is just get one nick on these one guys nick. and okay. he'd win. So I think that they, for people like myself, um, knew uh, he, he indicated to us that he did uh, indicated to us really quickly by him licking the knife and like you know you know basically trying to cut his tongue. Oh, okay, right. That it's not think, poisoned. Okay. Correct, because the threat that he has against Paul is that his blade is poisoned, and all he needs to do is get one nick on Paul at the end of the fight. So is that where where Mayor Knife Chip and Shatter comes from? Is no, like... what, Mayor Knife Chip and Shatter comes from the um teeth of the those um um I think it's a Fremen saying. From yeah, it's cuz like their knives are the teeth of a Shai Hulud, of right? The, of the Shai Hulud. And so in order for those teeth to stay constituted and and not shatter is so this is what's interesting too is that they really didn't explain this and they just were like willy nilly holding out the knives or you know the um the Shai Hulud tooth. What yeah. is the name of the actual knife? I can't remember now. Oh, uh, uh I know what you're talking about. I a, a stilt Still, knife or something like that. Like something. Um. So anyway, those knives will break. If they Chris don't, knife. Chris knife. Chris knife. Those knives will break if they don't let blood out if they don't get blood once they've been unsheathed so they're not supposed to be unsheathed without blood having been let so Ooh, like okay, okay i know okay. i know so like all of those people that were like yeah paul they would have had to have cut themselves and then put the knife away in, oh, in actual okay. fremen culture which is interesting uh so it's fine that they cause obviously they just didn't make that but i that that was was something for me though is that what's Paul's knife? I think like, he has Jamis's knife. Does he have Jamis's knife? Do, I does believe he take so. It? We don't see him do that, but I imagine yeah. he would get Jamis's knife. Yeah, and that was like another. It's like a, a silly nitpick, but like when you see Fade Roth's knife, they do look sharp. They look sharp. Yeah, as yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when he like takes the emperor's knife at the end, it's and very show, dull looking. It's very dull, and so is Paul's. I'm like, the, obviously, like, I don't know, make them sharp for the the close up, and then obviously have you know prop knives for the fight, you know, whatever you want to do. But like, there's got to be a like if you are showing me two knife close ups, one with blood on it, like Paul's knife, uh, when he Has first been doing enters. Work. Yeah, Paul's knife at the. After the fight with Fade Rotha, and then in the throne room after the Baron, looks sharp. It looks like a knife. That looks really good, and so do like the Sardaukar swords. Right, but like totally. I just even seeing the second time, I was like, both of those knives look fake. Yeah, and so it was it, so weird for a movie that's oh my gosh, it's gonna win costumes, it's gonna win you know production design, all these things. There's so much detail. It seemed like such a, a weird oversight. For like, close especially when you've had other knife close-ups, 
showing how sharp these things are, how dangerous and deadly these are, you have these really dull looking prop knives. I'm like, hmm, especially with how much like in the first movie where he's like, give me the Chris knife, you'll you'll get your own. And they don't show that. I don't know. Yeah, For that's me, that, a really good point. Yeah, I was, I was kind of disappointed point. on that. Well, because this, what's interesting about Dune, for as far as the future that it is set in, there's still all of these um, ancient ducal emperor rights yes. and things. You know, they fight hand to hand. And so, yeah, I don't know what the benefit is, is showing us this dull ass knife. It's crazy. And yeah, and, like, the, yeah, it's a good the, point. The, the, the thing about, I think we saw personal shields one time or like besides fade rotha putting his on we saw it when uh you know after timmy is like oh we got the throne room take the prisoners away and the look when he's like kill the sardaukar take the prison i was like oh oh my god Tim- <laughs> timothy <laughs> timothy timothy <laughs> timothy uh we see it like a little bit with gurney halleck what he where he's fighting i feel like there was like personal shields there on the on a on the harkonnen but I was like, it was such a weird thing with how prevalent they were in the first movie. Right. That they were just kind of absent and with no explanation. So Yeah, it know. must be because they were assuming with all the attacks that Laz guns were being used. That had to be the reason. Which is interesting, though, too. Chani, if she shot the... <laughs> The ornithopter with a Laz gun, she could have just blown it up instead of having to use like a rocket if without the yeah, shields being. Yeah, especially because like as soon as she RPGs the hel- the ornithopter, the Laz guns come in like they were waiting for the air support. And like I understand strategically, you're waiting for the air support to reveal your position, but it's just like that could have probably taken down the ornithopter. But it I don't would know. have. It, yeah, I just I'm just realizing that now that it's this kind of. It, kind of cool sequences but maybe kind so of like cool. not oh, the not magnetic like... mines coming out and just oh. like i've never seen that before like that's <laughs> yeah because yeah. like you you see the sand moving you're like oh there he's and it's so good like reestablishing how capable gurney is is that like he's out there kind of by himself immediately spots the ambush and then dodges one mine and then shoots another before it hits the the spice miner and then just like Everything's going down in flames. So am I. Shink. And just starts walking. I'm like, oh my gosh. Woo. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So, you know, I also was, it was really unfortunate that Denis came out and said that dialogue in movies is useless <sighs> before this movie came out. Like, say that after. Because this entire time while I'm watching this movie, I was like, well, then cut this line, bro. Then cut that it's line. Not, he's saying he prefers visuals to dialogue. I know. Like, I understand. He has some and of the I best actually dialogue. Don't. Like, if you like, go watch any of his other movies. Like, the di- the dialogue is really good in every movie he's ever made. Sure. So it's just like... you know what, though? Because you can talk a thing to death. Absolutely. Yes. So I'm not saying... He's categorically wrong. It just was really funny. I was like, well, you need a dialogue here, Denise. What do you say? <laughs> no, and that's why I quote tweeted that. I was like, guys, I promise Denise reading all of your Twitter replies where you're saying, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn and giving all your favorite movie quotes. <laughs> I loved your And I'm sure he's really just like tossing and turning and it's like, shut up. Like, yeah. this, man, this man is on like a 10 kill streak with movies. Every American movie he's ever made is an absolute banger. And then you go watch his foreign films of Ansan Dees and Polytechnic, and they're both devastating and brutal, he has not missed. This he knows what he's doing. This man has not missed. Yeah. Like, believe me, he's better than you. <laughs> 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 and no, but you're right. He is reading and laboring all of, our, of, of all of our tweets. Yes, he's definitely like on X or Twitter X, whatever you call it, and just like, oh, uh, Joe Smith 69 said, um, you... <laughs> You better get a bigger boat. Oh, I was so wrong. Oh, shut <laughs> up. I love it. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I mean, we basically talked about everything. So like, we didn't. So yeah, we, I mean, what we, we talked missed? about the plot. Now let's yes. get into a couple major changes. This, and is, yeah, of, this is why I want to talk to you about this because one, I was like talking about Doom, but then again, I want to hear because I know Chani's the big Huge. difference in Huge. this and so how did you feel about that because i loved it but i can understand you know uh we 
I was just talking about, you know, we talked about last week of like the differences in Aragorn, like, you know, the differences of a translation of, you know, the Avatar, the last airbender Netflix series, what they're leaving out, what they're changing. And so how do you, do you feel about some of the big changes of this movie? So uh, genuinely my least favorite choice was how venomous Jessica was. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we need to see her just become full heel, heel turn. I think we could have seen her buy. What's more interesting to me is how in the book she just buys into Fremen culture. She's like becomes 100% Fremen, really. Yeah. Um, and you could, as opposed to manipulating these people, because these are not people to be manipulated. And if you remember what Duncan understands and what the Harkonnens don't is that the Fremen are toe to toe with the Sardukar, if not even better. Sardukar, oh, yeah, it's one Fremen to five Sardukar can be dispatched, and that's insane. And so is Duncan, it really? un I believe, if I might be correct. I mean, they kind of show that in this, and it's really interesting. Some when they go hand to out. hand towards the end, yeah, and they they I. Sh I noticed this and I kind of want to watch them like parallel is that in the first movie, Paul's dream sequence of him on the battlefield in his armor, like, you know, doing his thing, flipping, it's almost mirrored to what Zendaya was doing in this movie. So it's like literally showing us Paul's dreaming about him being the protagonist and saving the Fremen when it's actually going to be Chani. And I'm just like, I didn't notice that. This is why the internet exists for the good of all mankind. Is That's that, interesting. That's so it's so subtle, but like literally she even does like the the kind of like the cartwheel over the dude, the back roll, slits him, and then like does like the whole pose for the camera. And you see the face. And you see I the didn't face. Think about that. It, I was just, like, like, where's his? Just chills. And and I will say, we didn't go over all the plot, but like I wish just selfishly, I wish the battle scene was a little bit longer. We did get the worm charge. We got the nuke. We got, you know, Chani's moment. We got Paul slow-mo, Kate blowing in the wind while the Fremen crest the hill. All amazing. I wish it was a tad longer just because, I mean, we're here. Might as well. Come on. What's another $10 million? Come on, WB. Let's go. Come um, on. <laughs> but you control the spice. But my ma another main complaint was is that when Fade takes over for Dave Batista, um, Rebin or Revan? Re it's supposed to be Raban. Raban, okay. So they say um, Robin. Yeah. Um, how does he know? Because like the the whole thing about the Fremen is that they use guerrilla warfare tactics. You can't find them, but somehow Fade just knows where they are, and he's like, "Oh, we're simply just gonna bomb them." It's like, well, you could have done that the whole time. I just didn't think they knew where they were. But yeah. he just finds their home. And that's – I literally thought because when they're – when he's, like, bombing it and you see it from, like, Chani and Paul's perspective, they're not there. And then they show, like, the empty pool. I was like, oh, yeah, they're not there. So they're okay. But then they show all the aftermath of everyone bloodied and everything like that. And I was like, oh, they were there. Well, what happened? So I don't remember how they found Siege Tabor, but they find it in the book and they do destroy it. This is one of the major changes. In the book, Chani becomes pregnant and they have a baby. Okay. And that baby is killed. Oh, by, in the here, in, the... in Siege Tabor. Because they're in the south. And he's be and the baby's being raised in Siege Tabor. I may be a, a little bit off, but I know for sure Duke Leto the second is born here. Gotcha. And is killed here, which even more like fuels the fervor of you know, Chani agreeing with Paul, all these things. So Siege Tabor is destroyed. I don't remember exactly how. They, that didn't exactly bother me 100% um, that they found it. Because what really was in, was interesting to me is that they just have no idea that there are thousands more like this. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Because like now they're like, oh, well, we can just go do the spice now. You have no idea. What's interesting, too, is um, – I'm going to – I'm gonna make a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk about a digression from the book, but then also like share one thing that's disappointing to me in the movie. Um, Baron gives Raban the the Arrakis so that he does screw it up, so that he's left no choice but to give it to Fade. So when he in in re, what they do here is that like how dare he screw it up because he you know he's supposed to do all those things he's never expected to he's not yeah. 
So that's what's interesting. The thing that disappoints me more than anything, I don't think we get enough Baron. I really, we don't get the threat yeah. of him. We, 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 we don't see him talk. We don't see the grotesqueness of him. There are issues from the book. In the book, he's pedophilic and he's a homosexual. And that's meant to be why he's a bad guy. And that's yeah. they, not they should. good. Yeah. That's not like that's not good from like like when you think when you think about like the Silence of the Lambs, he's a, a bad guy and a transsexual, you know, like yeah. you're not so, that's not how we should be telling stories about our bad guys. So it's good that they digress from that. You see him that he's like killed two of the slaves, you know. Yeah. Show us that. Or, you know, let us wa- watch let us watch him watch somebody before he kills them or something. We just need to, I mean, so, we need a little I more agree. time with him. Because, like, he, they did such a good job with, like, him eating while Duke is, like, you know, sitting there naked. And then he, like, oh, floats totally. over. Oh, totally. Kills Dr. Yue. And just, like, oh, this guy, like, he's the worst. Like. So maybe maybe it's, like, a world where, you know, you did a, such a good job of helping me understand, like, in the first movie, the Nazgul are the bad guy. In the second movie, Saruman yeah. is the bad guy. You know, Fade's the bad guy in this one. In the third movie, Paul should be the bad guy. Because he. Kind of is. He kind of is. So, so the digression here is Chani having a baby that gets killed. That doesn't happen here. Um, I don't know if they have the children at the end of the first book, but I do believe they do. Okay. Um, they have twins at the end of the book. Doesn't need to happen here. It didn't yeah. need to. Um, Chani, Paul says when he says, I'm going to marry Ireland. Chani's down. She gets it. I mean, she's a little pissed, but she also gets it. He says to Chani in that, uh, he says to Ireland in that moment, I will never give you a child. You will only be my wife in name. And this is my true wife to Chani. And it's awesome. And Ireland has to just sit there and take it. And that character is fascinating for what she's like. She's basically cowed in that moment. It's wild. Yeah. So that's a big change. And then, Overall, at, at first, I'm like, why did they just make this huge digression from Chani? And I really think it's their best way to show that this character still has agency, that this person, that that um, the white the white savior of it all isn't the isn't the chosen path. Isn't yeah, I'm really curious because like especially with him, you know, like literally saying out loud, "This is a marriage in name only," which would have brought the house down as well. Like, if they would have done that in the movie, everyone would have been like, that's right! Like, because yeah. you know, literally, yeah. <laughs> last time I saw it, uh, when he go when Charlotte Rampling's like, you're an abomination, he goes, silence! With yeah. the voice, oh. a guy behind me was like, damn! <laughs> 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 like, hadn't said a word the whole movie, and it just goes, damn! <laughs> and then... And then right after that, he's like, oh, I will take, I will take your daughter. And then they show... Uh, Chani's uh, face. Z- Chani's face, and he goes, "Oh my!" <laughs> like, <laughs> the guy said like, that. <laughs> same thing. I was just like, he said three words, and I, like I started laughing because I was like, it was my it's second funny. time viewing it. <laughs> Alex and I were talking about this last night too, because before the movie, there was this guy who was like watching Twisters and yeah. watching, you know, Furiosa, and like every like funny line he would like re say it and chuckle to himself. He goes, "We had twins," <laughs> and like, and all Alex was was prepared for this guy to talk throughout the movie. Thank God he didn't, but yeah. he did only once when uh, Stilgar. And Gurney go to look at the warheads. He goes, oh, it's very stupid that you put it there. And he's like, well, did you look for it? Or, or did you find it? And he goes, well, I wasn't looking for it. Which is great, a great line. And yeah. then this guy goes, did you look for it? Or did you find it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like he had gone too far in the movie. Yeah. Not repeating something. And he yeah, couldn't you gotta stop say himself. One. You gotta say yeah. one. And I'm 100% sure that the guy next to me was nodding off. And then was embarrassed that he was nodding off. Because when he would regain his head. He would like. <laughs> the snap back. Yeah. He would have. That would happen. And then he would like laugh like he was watching a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like that video where uh, the the classroom starts clapping and the guy wakes up and is like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. A mm-hmm. hundred. Pr- that was happening multiple, multiple times. Oh, I love it. I love it. So uh, overall, I really like it. I think it's good. I actually will watch it again. I need to rewatch the first one again. I'm a very big fan of Timothy Chalamet. I really wanted to hate him, man. I wanted to. I can't. 
I can't. can't. You can't. can't. He's so good. He's so he's, good in this movie. And you know, he's still a dork, and he's still a little bro dude, and he's really good, and Rebecca Ferguson is very good, and Austin Butler was so much better than I thought he was going to be. I wish they had drawn out also the fight sequence between Gurney and Raban just a little bit more. It was like a really quick death. But I, I agree. Uh, but it like also he- kind of works because Raban's not that great. He thinks he's great. Oh, when he tur- when he's like, get me on the ground, and then he turns and runs what that is that's so why good. you hire dave batista because like he he looks like a you know a meathead but sure. like the fear where he goes from like well deep show yourself and then he does and you see just like his face somehow go even wider yes and him turning around and running is so great yep oh my gosh and then but yeah like i i agree i wanted the fight to last a little longer but then it was when just Josh too quick Brolin, for no reason when he says, for my Duke and my friends, and then just twist the knife in his throat, I was like, oh, that's the stuff right there. <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. It, it it took its time at the top to really get you to become a Fremen along with Paul. And mm. then you really feel the, be- you know what it is? You're supposed to feel the betrayal that Chani's feeling. But, but what I think I felt more was her hope that he wasn't going, that she wasn't losing him all the way. And then you really believe at the end, she's heartbroken. That's um, the thing, like, she's not, like, she's mad, but just, like, she, she's crying. And, and, and you don't give water. You're not no, supposed to do that. No, that whole thing is that you don't give your water away. And it is, it is a beautiful final shot of just her waiting for Shai Hulu to come to like take her. Cause it's just it like, it totally works. That is, that's the hero shot and the music is swelling. And you're like, this is not a hopeful ending where we just started an intergalactic multi-house war. That's going to cost billions of lives. Like he has foreseen and the people of Arrakis are going to suffer probably more than anything. Oh, by the way, when he, it almost made me not like the line in the first movie where the Baron says, my Arrakis, my Dune. Because when Timothy Chalamet says, your mother was was 12 when a rock hit her in the face while crossing the storms. Back then it had a Fremen name. Dune. And I was like, oh, he said it! He said the thing! <laughs> It really worked. <laughs> it really it worked. It was so good. And like the guy's reaction of like, Lisa Nagaib. I was like, you know what? I'm in. He is. He is Lisa Nagaib. <laughs> but just like when like if Timothy Chalamet walked up to me and said, Dune. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you get the Dune buckets. Yeah, that is what it's for. <laughs> just like I, it is, especially because now do you think this movie would have served Doing it the Peter Jackson way, you know, bringing it back to Lord of the Rings with like all, you know, apparently three movies. I thought it was just going to be a two parter, but we are for sure getting a third one. I think he said he wants to take some time and, you know, like step back. You know, it's obviously an arduous process of like traveling to the desert and filming everything on location. But do you think it would have served better to do it Peter Jackson style or are you wanting a break or would you want this, you know? I know this one got pushed, but like, would you want one every November for three years in a row? Wow. Listen, if you're going to do it right, I don't care when it comes. Yeah. You know, I just don't want to die in between. (laughs) That's why, like, I don't care. That's why I didn't care that this was coming out because I couldn't suspend that emotion. Like, oh, man, this is going to happen. So, you know, because it was getting pushed way too much. At that point, I just, I'm just i going to forget the one it's coming out. I don't want to know anything about it's, it. I will say, as uh, as much as I was looking forward to it, it snuck up on me. I forgot that it was, like, opening this last week. And I was like, oh, my God. And that really was better is. for me. That yeah, was better. Same. Same. Because I got to be excited about it instead. Or, or actually go into it without all this anticipation of what it could be. So if if we get a movie that is as good and honestly maybe better than the first one which the first one's really just edging if you really ask me it's good but um this, is, better. this is 
this is this an is Empire better. Strikes Back. This is a Two Towers. This it's is better. It's yeah. better, and and for the right reasons too. You know, did you don't get this movie if you don't have the legs gained by the first one. Yeah, you know, you can't make this movie without it. So give me. Give me number three and tell me how Chani gets bought back in. Tell me what what your perp, what your narrative is here. Um, I'm really curious. I'm curious what he's going to do with it because there's a lot of ways he could digress just based off of what the choices he's – nothing – I don't think he could do anything wrong, but I'd be really curious to see how he interprets the narrative that Frank Herbert intended to tell too. But by having Chani dissent, even though it's a huge change, I don't think – I think it's the shorthand for the audience to go, like you're saying, Paul's the bad guy. And I don't know how else you accomplish that. I'm really curious because it is such a digression um, that I've been told. I'm wondering how far digress we're going to get with the next book or, you know, with the next movie. If like I'm I'm really it, it does it. It is hard, like you're saying to be like, I can't wait for Dune part three and, you know, 2027 probably. Um, it's crazy. I, what am I, I, I can't maintain that level of interest. I can't. It's it's a long ways away. It's basically waiting for the next Avatar. Like it's um, who knows when that's going to come out. Um, but thank God I don't care about that. <laughs> I, I liked Way of Water, but oh, it's not at the level of this. But it's just like it is. It is so interesting to see what's going to come next because I wasn't expecting a part three. I think sure. he had, I heard him talk about it be like, oh yeah, I'd, I'd like to make three movies, but it felt like you. This is a complete story for sure. Like it ends with, you know, the beginning of a war, but you can end it right here. And I don't think anyone would be dissatisfied besides like wanting more. I don't think people need more. Like you don't need to tell a third like story. Like you needed it after the first movie. Yeah. Like as much as people compare this to Empire Strikes Back, you know, like you could say like Baron Harkonnen and Fade Rotha are both dead. Your right. two main antagonists from the first and second movie are both dead. Paul is the emperor, whether in name only, if not honored by the other houses. You don't need him to be like, oh, I have to conquer every house to become emperor or, you know, whatever the third movie is going to be. You could end this. Like, you don't have Darth Vader out there still waiting to fight Luke Skywalker. You don't right. have, you 100%. know, Leia and Chewie going off to find Han Solo. Like, But he did set up Chani and Paul. Now, he did. As, he did set up a sequel. Which and I you do want to know. You want to know the end to that. I I want to know. I Here's what to. I'm going to say. Ultimately, I don't love living in a world where you got to see what the box office numbers are before they so greenlight the second man. one. Like, let's have some artistic integrity and just take a shot on something. You know yeah. what I mean? So that I don't love about the culture that we're in nowadays. But despite that, we got a great film out of it. We did. And it's, and it's so strange that, like, they'll do – you know, they'll keep making – this is – like, they've already – another dc and i like i like comic movies i don't want to like pile on them or something but it's like you keep dumping these 200 million dollars into madam web and stuff like that and it's like no let's do that sony let's make every spider-man movie without spider-man in it because people love it they don't uh instead of like you know investing in directors and it's and that's the thing you don't need to give a director 200 million dollars you can give him 30 million dollars and that way if your movie makes Fifty million dollars, you win. Yeah. Do you see how the Conjuring universe has made twelve movies? And you know why? Because their movies cost ten million dollars. They make twenty million on the first weekend, and you're like, okay, now we're in the black, and we're fine. Everything else from here is pure profit. And right. you keep making them, and they keep making fifty million dollars, and they keep costing ten million dollars. The math, math. Stop spending two hundred million. <laughs> like, but on the other hand. What was it like Gladiator 2? I've read it went from 150 million to like 300. I'm like, hell yes. <laughs> you know what? Bankrupt yourself. Studios, you're so stupid. David Zaslav, you're a, you're a penny pinching evil person who like destroys actual art. So, you know what? Just bankrupt yourself. Keep spending money on these ridiculous projects that that's not good. Like, the fact that Indiana Jones cost over $300 million. I love Indiana Jones. It was never going to make that at the box office. Oh, I can't imagine. Never. Right. Never. And yet they won't let Wile E. Coyote, which people are literally begging for. Yeah. 
So they'll just let that be a tax write off. And the fact that Dune still made the kind of money it did when it was the day and date on HBO Max too. Like the fact that it still right. made money. That was and that was like almost unfair to put that like level on it. Like, yeah. well, let's see what you could do. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of COVID. It's great crazy that they did that. But it I worked out. I saw the first one twice in theaters and probably like fifteen times on HBO Max though. I watched well, that thing I'm, so much. I do have to rewatch it. Uh, I've only watched it once. Like I said, it wasn't like Everything I've always ever wanted. Because genuinely, genuinely, at the end of the day, the experience of Dune for me is A, talking about it and mm-hmm. understanding it better through conversation and reading it. Reading it is just the way I want to imbibe that world. So I'm excited for you to read it. We'll probably do podcasts of the things while you're reading it and we'll just talk about it. Then. Absolutely. I'm I'm very excited to talk about this. Um Oh, I had a thought. Uh, would you do a double feature with this? Like, would you go to a theater, watch the sure. part one, take a little pee break, and then watch part two? <laughs> yeah, I actually took a pee break. I took a pee break um, when Gurney started playing guitar. Unfortunately, so I missed <gasps> that. I know. Uh, I know. I, I, I did it right. I will say, I did it right after that scene uh, when he talks about the nukes, and then I saw on my second watch, I saw the conversation with him and Chani after that but that was when i took a pee break and then i came back and then and that's for the design when they open the door and then like he throws in like the lantern thing that the suspenser light yeah 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 so cool it's so cool it's so simple that's stuff that they describe in the books and i really am excited for you to get the texture that it's explained it's really just when you think frank herbert's explaining something too much he changes so you will it will be an an experience of reading for sure because he also birthed this genre he really did in in novel form so it had yet to be refined but it still works very well um Folks, there's several different ways you can get in contact with us and let us know what your thoughts are on the movie because I'm interested to learn. Very what interesting. The world thinks about this. And I'm genuinely glad that we did this episode because I know how much you've been stoked on it. And it's, I liked it. And I was excited to talk about the differences. I'm so why happy it you liked it. Like, Me I, too. I, I was like afraid because I didn't hear from you after. So I was like, she's just saving all these things and she's going to drop this freaking bomb on me that it was mid and all these things but i'm very happy you like no it. i'm not i don't need to be you know what, what's the word when you just like i'm not oh, i'm not counterculture a, yeah that's not me and i also not trying to go into something looking for a problem i yeah usually um but overall, just yeah, definitely enjoyed it. And I, I didn't want to—I didn't want to accidentally say one thing and let you know exactly how I felt. Then I, I forgot to talk about it at the, sh- at the on the show. So um, it, next week we have a special guest in Scott Rubin. So you want to take uh, time to make sure you listen to that episode. If you're a member of our Patreon, you'll get to listen to that episode early. Go to patreon.com forward slash. Uh, podcast of the rings there's several different ways you can interact with our show and support us at the same time once we get to 10 subscribers on our patreon then we will watch separately not on the patreon we will watch um g lord of the g strings and then do a patreon only episode and talk about lord of the g strings with scott rubin and once we get to 15 we'll be reading the crazy version of the animated Lord's Rings that didn't get made where there's like a sex scene between Galadriel and Frodo. Some like hot stuff happens. So we'll do a live reading of that once we get to 15 Patreon subscribers. So go subscribe to our Patreon. Um, Ben, you're doing some fun stuff on Twitch. Uh, I am enjoying myself right now, but I really want this thing to grow right here. And I can't thank Jess enough because like I said, I texted her at... 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon uh, and said, we need to do an episode about Dune. Let me know when you're free. And you changed my weekend, that's for sure. I did, and I can't thank her enough for putting this together because she's got to go edit this thing. She's got to <laughs> censor, oh, <that's> censor <laughs> me. <laughs> I, I don't know. If you, if you haven't listened to the the, the show, I, now every time there's a, a, a curse, instead of just re-editing it, I'll put column, column. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Because <laughs> whatever. We're adults. Hey, um, we're, we're all adults here. Uh, but yeah, so thank you to Jess for putting in the extra hours. And uh, I'm glad, I, you know, I am glad I got her out to the theater again as well. 
Alex and I had yet to go see a movie together. I know. So this, we actually, there was, there was a couple firsts that happened all thanks to the Dune bucket. Um, until <laughs> next, next. Shy hello, if you know what I mean. Oh, no. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm Jeez. so sorry, everybody. I'm no, so sorry. It's great. It's <laughs> what else did they think they were making? All right. Until There's next no time. There's no possible way. Uh, may our spice meet again. Mm-hmm.